we don't normally get snow and we oh, had a little wow. of snow and it's like oh how exciting i know <laughs> our uh our dog just loves it a little puppy just goes out there and, and plays in it like crazy you know is running around then comes in all big big uh, uh, yeah and we got um of course carlos is probably has this experience of it our uh um, my niece from uh, Florida comes up when she sees snow. She's pretty happy too. So, hi, Dawn. So, uh, anyway, I guess we could we could get started here. Now, I don't think Nick's going to be here, so I thought that we can either hi, go on, uh, do an exercise at the end, or um, you know, we can uh, just all. Um, I think it's fun for people to just talk about. Um, you, you know, what is uh, their path or something? You know, it's always kind of fun to hear what other people have uh, have going. Unless you got something, Gary. You're not, you've been kind of out of it, but. Yeah, no, I was thinking that I might do a uh, dialoguing with painting. Oh, um, sure. Okay. You know, it's, it's been a while, you know. Yes, um, it is. And those, yeah. um, I mean, those are the best. I mean, they really are. And uh, I mean, I I truly think when we do those, that I feel um, unconscious material coming up. I know that Marina, that one time you had some kind of a, um, almost a birth in the, in the sea. Do you remember that? There was sort of a, something happened in the ocean or something. You maybe don't remember it, but I thought it was really good, you know, but it was like an egg or something. I can't remember. Well, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Well, I thought before um, we got started on the other material. But it's interesting, really, because it's about, if I can't remember, it was, it's the unconscious. Yes, it was. And, and, it, and it speaks, you know, it speaks, it's not you, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a mystery. Well, it spo it. spoke to me because, uh, I think why it spoke to me is because I think all unconscious material speaks to me. I'm kind of a, like a, you know, intuitive but um, I mean, I always, I, I think I really have a uh, uh, visceral cellular level reaction <laughs> when I hear uh, something that is genuine content of, of the unconscious. So uh, I know it struck me at the time, but it was, it was very genuine in other words. Hi, Jan. When, when you hear something that you really know is the real thing, it's uh, pretty, um, you know, awesome. Well, you know, before we get into the, uh, uh, just the tail end of lecture two, I thought we'd just go over, um, just review the first section because there's so many terms in here, kind of get lost. But, you know, as I go through it a bit uh, more and more, I, I start to find my bearings. And you'll find that the way that Young approaches this is he goes around and around it. You know, so, I mean, it's the fact that he goes around and around it, it and keeps bringing up new aspects. Uh, we, we learn more about so, uh, the same thing over uh, as he, as he does it. Like today, you know, we're going to hopefully get to the uh, different animals that are associated with, um, with the, the, uh, the first, um, uh, at least the first five chakras. You know, I don't know if there's uh, one with the sixth, and Young really says there's only six chakras because the seventh one, you know, you went out of existence, really. So you've left the, left the plane of, of, of individual, in being individualized, because individualized means to split off from infinity as, a, as an entity of awareness, you know. And so once you went into the seventh chakra, you have you you be you just uh, you know become melt went back into the melding pot, you know you've left the realm of rebirth, you know. But anyway, so just to summarize the last uh, time, uh, first he talked about the importance of Muladhara, uh, you know that that it's the symbol of our earthly, and this was in um, surprising to me, you know that Muladhara is is not this inert force. It's the symbol of our earthly conscious existence, which is the, you know, sort of the banal, ordinary 
level of rational thinking. And the main uh, point about it is that the um, gods are asleep. So it's everything that has to do with life when there are no un un unconscious powers. So uh, it's, uh, it is really the, the level of, uh, um, of, uh, of where man is the only power. And actually, um, it's, it's also, it, you know, it is, it is the realm of, of what you would call personalistic psychologies, like he's, he'll mention later that Freud and Adler will, will never leave the realm of Muladhara. And in fact, very few people do leave the room of, uh, realm of Muladhara because that's when you're recognizing there's nothing behind this door. Don't look behind this door. There's nothing here. And Jung says, yes, there is something behind that door. Then you've moved into the next chakras. Okay. So uh, anyway, the purpose of yoga, the purpose of life is awakening the kundalini, awakening these sleeping gods in Muladhara. So in other words, this is just the first chakra at Muladhara. And there's six that follow it. So um, you, there's there's this, this sense that um, uh, it, it's, it's a womb for another condition or another development. The actual existence in this world is a sort of a womb. We're not meant to stay in this condition. We're planted in Muladhara or on earth for another purpose that transcends uh, bodily existence. You know, so um, Muladhara is kind of when it's called the, the realm of sprouting. Yet we think it's the final culmination of evolution and civilization, you know, where it's really is is just the first chakra of six and he's going to get to so the purpose of of yoga the purpose of life is awakening the kundalini awakening the gods and separating the gods from muladhara uh, so they can become active and this is also what happens in alchemy too you know where you uh uh you, you know where you see gabriel blowing the trumpet he's not to awaken the dead he's a, to awaken the sleeping gods in muladhara you know and and have them uh um you know uh cook them with our ego attention in the vessel and we're going to learn more that manipura is is a cooking vessel too so um it, it, then um uh so, and, and he he mentioned that he interrupted the uh, seminars of Christiana Morgan with this study because people were asking about her personal uh, si life, personal biography. And it's sort of, um, you know, uh, saying, what he was kind of saying is, well, we're not, I'm not Freud and I'm not Adler. I mean, I'm, you, you know, if you wanna go uh, talk about uh, her personal biography, go talk to Freud and Adler, you know, I'm here more for the impersonal symbols that uh, she manifests. And he's going to uh, go over uh, the importance of, of, uh, of the impersonal experience. There's two psychologies. There's the rational one where only the personal aspect is considered. Only the, the person, the personal is the only meaningful thing. But in uh, analytical psychology, what he called his own psychology, Personal things are uninteresting. They don't um, contain the supreme value. And he says they're futile and illusory. And I've heard people describe it like you're rearranging the deck chairs on the ship Titanic before it goes down. I mean, it doesn't really help to have all the deck chairs in order. You know, so, um, and, and he says, only the second psychology allows us a point of view to understand Muladhara existence, you know? So, so, so his, he's saying analytical psychology gives us a standpoint that we can look, look and see what Muladhara existence really is and not be so concerned with how, order, how um, adapted we are to Muladhara existence but what is Muladhar existence? You know, so the idea of having a standpoint outside is to understand 
what existence is, where the other psychologies are just saying, adapt to Muladhara, you know, and that's all you need to do, you know. So, um, but that's not awakening the gods that are asleep in Muladhara and awakening the Kundalini. And, and the awakening the Kundalini is in no way personal development. Uh, it's only impersonal uh, and impersonal. And um, it is as, as it, it develops, uh, a lot happens, but it's not ego and we can't um, identify with it. You know, uh, I mean, the idea is ego and what is happening in the unconscious uh, symbols that we're discussing in visions are that ego and the uh, unconscious visions are now in a dialogue to create a symbol and the symbol is the new awareness. So we're recreating, we're creating a third center of awareness that is neither in Muladhara nor is it in the Pleroma, it's in, uh, it's in the in the temple of wisdom or the philosopher's stone. So, and this is what he's saying is the point, not only of the Kundalini yoga, but of alchemy and of his own psychology and of Christiana Morgan's visions. So um, anyway, that was his point for digressing with this. But I mean, we're gonna learn a ton. I mean, we're just getting into it and, it, and it's not, uh, we're gonna have a lot of revelations. and. Um, so anyway, um, the, the Kundalini, as it moves up, pulls us with it, you know, but it is, um, it's not under our control, you know, uh, it's outside the human realm, this movement, which is, um, you know, uh, uh, is the unconscious material coming up. And uh, so the unconscious material coming up is awakening the, the Awakening unconscious material is the same thing as saying awakening the Kundalini. And it's the same thing as saying uh, that the sleeping gods awake. Then the idea of the sleeping gods is that unconscious material is coming up. Ego is having a dialogue with it. And it creates this third center of awareness, which is neither in either realm and is, uh, is the is the purpose for existence is, and, and, and that new symbol gradually is what is, um, is the evolution of, creates the evolution of the God image. This is at least uh, the Western thought, you know. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, it's what the uh, Kundalini Yoga uh, was anticipating in the East. But um, so when, when we see these uh, other um, chakras start to activate, we're, we're seeing the unconscious activate, uh, but it's not my unconscious, it's not his unconscious or her unconscious. It is, is a, um, it is something that is impersonal and that's very strange to us. And even if we did recognize that this, these, this uh, awareness is not us, it's not ours, it's non-ego, it's impersonal, um, we still are a long way from knowing what it means. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, um, that I, I'm, is a challenge. I'm not saying I got the answer. So, and then he, he gave the importance of being born into Muladhara. If, if, you're, if your seed doesn't uh, plant on the earth and grow out of the earth. By the way, hi, Kevin and Suresh and uh, Jordy. Uh, we're just getting started here. We're just reviewing the last session uh, first. And, and so anyway, that, that un, unless our seed is planted in the earth and we have a standpoint on the earth, uh, the, other, uh, the other alternative of not being born is to have the seed um, go to some thick area of the air and it never reaches the earth. And so nothing ever is um, sprouts. And so there is no nothing, you never really existed on the world unless you obtain roots. And that's what Muladhara means is root base. And so now there's nothing to awaken because you're in the realm of infinity. So you're kind of in the realm of the gods and there isn't this um, polarity uh, where the ego and the unconscious can have a, a tension 
that creates uh, the um, the thing in the middle. Hi, Tim. You know, we're just uh, getting started. I'm just reviewing the last part. So then that, that's the aspect of that you need to be born, that Muladhar is extremely important. Okay. And then... Um, uh, then he uh, talks about Mani. Well, he talked about Svadhisthana, and he's going to talk more about Svadhisthana, which is the water chakra. And it's um, that's our initiation into the Kundalini, is to go under the water and, uh, um, you know, and then not get eaten up by the. Uh, oh, well, it, what, what he's going to, he's going to tell us this later, but um, see. Where the elephant is so important in um, in the uh, first uh, chakra, you know, the elephant, and the elephant is the ego. Really, it's the way of of uh, that we are the most powerful force in Muladhara, you know, and it's uh, it has an idea of of that it, it, that we are completely under control or something. Uh, of the the world, then uh, then when we move to the realm of the uh, second, the water world, uh, uh, which is uh, Svadhisthana, uh, we are entering then the um, realm of. Uh, now Jung says this: the Makara is this is the elephant. It's the water elephant. But now instead of being our friend, it devours us. And and the idea is that the this big elephant in in the unconscious uh, is only going to make us a, uh, we're going to uh, ego consciousness is going to drown there or be devoured, you know. So um, it um, what what it, he and he says that's an enantiadromia, you know, the uh, elephant where it was the positive being in Muladhara is the absolute most terrible being in in the uh in the in svadhisthana you know and then we move to uh manipura which is the fire chakra and uh that is we're going to learn a lot about manipura today but um manipura is associated uh with the ram okay and uh so um it is a sacrificial animal, and what is really we're sacrificing is are the are the passions, and uh, these three handles on the outside are young things are like the handles of a pot, and so that the the uh, the fires in Manipura are meant to be like the fires in the alchemical vessel, and they are meant to uh, digest what we experienced in uh, the water world. When we first became acquainted with the unconscious, then we need to digest that image in, uh, in Manipura, you know, which is uh, kind of an, like an alchemical pot, you know, and it's a three-handled alchemical pot. So uh, anyway, um, the, the Manipura is the fire center. It's the place where the sun rises the sun appears in its first light uh, and only after we've left the water world. So it's another enantiadromia. Now the animal shifted from the elephant to the makara from, from Muladhara, the first chakra, to uh, Savadistana, the second chakra, which was it went from the beneficent animal to this horrible devouring animal. But it's the same animal, Young says. What it, he says is kind of like the, um, the mother who's very nurturing in your youth, but if you grow up and you still live with her after you're an adult, she becomes the devouring mother. So it's a similar image. It's not this, it's, they're not really related, but they're similar. That the mother, if you stay in the unconscious too long, she becomes devouring. And the, the idea of, of your life force, okay? But here the devouring is of, uh, you want to go on, you want to become acquainted with the unconscious, but you don't want to drown in it. So you're leaving the world of ordinary reality. You're going into the water world and you're becoming acquainted with the unconscious, but don't drown in it. That's the danger. Okay. 
then after you become acquainted with the unconscious, then you move to Manipura. And this is the realm of the passions and stuff. This is where it seizes you. See, and now see in the first, uh, 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 this, the, now the, the, everything after Muladhara now, you are in Kwai up, being acquainted with the unconscious. That means you're being acquainted with the gods that were asleep in Muladhara. So everything we meet from now on is outside of ego control. It's non-ego. So first the water world's non-ego uh, and we're acquainted with the unconscious. So it, and it's, it's wonderful that in, in Catholic baptism, the Manip Manipura and, uh, or Savaristana, the water world and Manipura are just almost absolutely referred to, you know, the after the baptism, the uh, priest brings a candle and he says, I give you relatedness to the sun. So after you leave the water world, the priest brings you a candle, Manipura, after you leave Svadistana, brings you a candle and says, I give you relatedness to the sun. Okay, now the fires of passion are meant to be what kindles the whole process from now on, but it needs to be, um, it needs to be channeled to be the energy, the power, dynamo and the power of, of everything that happens from now on. But the idea is you can get lost in that, just like you can get uh, drowned in the, un, in the water of the unconscious. So there needs to be, you need to keep your feet in Muladhara as long as you live. As long as you live, you are a vibrant member of Muladhara. And I think that means the Prometheus stance. You know, we always are going to be Prometheus, even though we're, we are being successively introduced to these unconscious um, uh, sleeping deities in the chakras, okay? So um, then, um, so, uh, and then he says that at Christ, you know, when he was baptized, becomes the anointed one. And he's now a non-personal symbolic personality. He becomes the Christus, the anointed one, you know. So Manipura is the first center of identification with unconscious uh, powers uh, that are related uh, to the fire. The fire is not in time or space, but it's in a fourth dimensional realm where time uh, is, ju is just... Uh, infinite duration and space doesn't exist. There's no moments, you know. So um, in 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 Svadistana, we were pushed into the unconscious to be cleansed and renewed, and become acquainted with the unconscious, and to take it seriously. And then in Antiodromia, we enter the fire realm, which is the realm of desires, passions, emotional world. And uh, uh, really everything breaks loose, you know, and, and uh, the uncontrollable desire is uh, really means that we've been seized by the unconscious. Now, are we going to go into anahata and, um, uh, and find, uh, uh, use those for the power of the dynamo of the process? Or are we always going to be a prisoner in Manipura is the question. And uh, the idea there is the ram is the ram of the sacrifice. You must use the passions, but you must sacrifice your identification with them and your delight in them, you know, or your being controlled by them, either through anger or um, whatever. But anyway, it's starting to make a little bit of sense. You know, I think this is the beauty of Joseph Campbell and and young is they can take these images and apply them to uh, really the history of, our, of human consciousness and to myth in general. So in Svadistana and Manipura, we become acquainted with the fire and uh, uh, we get to that point where uh, with the unconscious and with the fire and we come to the point where we, uh, where the, somebody says, nobody is behind that door don't look here. There's nothing important here. You know, that Freud and Adler said uh, there isn't anything behind there. And 
Jung says, but there is something behind that door. There are such powers, they exist. So he's saying that the, uh, the water world, Savadista is real, Manipura is real. Where Freud and Adler would say, those are illusions. You know, become adapted in Muladhara and forget this stuff. It's, it is the, um, uh, what, what, what did, uh, it's the black uh, something, you know, young, he, Freud accused young of being this, uh, the, the occult, uh, you, you know, uh, admiring man in the uh, blackness of, of the occult, you know, and, but that's where Jung's going full force. So uh, anyway, um, uh, now we're going to, uh, so we, we just talked a little bit about um, that Manipura is in the diaphragm and you think with the gut and the heart chakra is, is where you've crossed the, the diaphragm of the, solar, uh, of the solar plexus and you've entered the heart and um, that the heart is, uh, is the only place that you can really get anything. So now this is where we left off. So there wasn't much left in that. Hi, Angel. Just getting started here. The, so the heart, uh, where this is new material here. The, the heart is air on the surface. Uh, the solar plexus is fire, and the svadhisthana is water. And and uh, the um, that that is um, uh, Manipura. Okay, just yeah. Hi, Angel. Uh, did you want to say something or? I, I well, never mind. The uh, um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, uh, we're going into uh, we're going to talk about um, the uh, what follows Manipura, and that is Anahata. And in an Anahata, we're lifted above the earth. Um, so so we went through the water world. We went through the fires of passion. The water world introduces the unconscious. Manipura is, is started the. Uh, let me see if I can. I'm just going to mute you for a second, Angela, Angela but you can unmute. Uh, but you, um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're over here, I think. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Uh, yeah, here we are. Okay. So uh, we, we, the sun, uh, we're lifted above the earth. And what happened? How did we get here at all? Uh, we, we were in Manipura, our, in, and in Manipura, our feet are still standing in Miladhara, but in Anahata, we are, are lifted above the earth. But it's, it's the realm of both thought and feeling. So now we've really entered two psychological functions, you know, thought and feeling, you know, and one is air and one is the heart, you know, and it's lifted above the earth, but how is it lifted above the earth? And it's lifted above the earth. How is the sun lifted above the earth? Now, I imagine you don't know anything about Galileo Copernicus and you're, uh, you're just a, a hunter gatherer and you see the horizon and you see the sun rise. This is analogous, Jung is saying to uh, Anahata is, is that we rise above the earth and uh, uh, that um, so now if you are identical with the sun and you were, that's what the priest told you after your baptism, you know, he brought you the burning candle and said that you are one with the sun, you know, the, I, the S-U-N sun, you know, uh, that uh, you also rise above the horizon. But it's also associated. Now, here, here's a very interesting that the heart is, is embedded with the lungs in our body. So, so the heart and the lungs and spirit are very closely related, you know, at least uh, even etymod etymologically they are, you know, somewhat. So uh, the, um, uh, and, and the sun is related to the wind too in, in Gnostic myth and not only in Gnostic myth, but, uh, you know, Jung had this famous story, which uh, was about a solar phallus man, 
you know, uh, this guy, you know, um, he was a patient in the Bergolzi uh, uh, where Young worked and he would bring Young over to the window and he'd say, do you see the sun there? It's there's it's it's phallus. Now it's phallus is the its creative instrument, and he says as it moves, it creates the wind. You know, so he was saying that the sun and and the wind are related, and this actually he found that later in a uh, uh, one of these um, Gnostic works that came from, uh, that were discovered in um, those jars in, uh, uh, in the Near East, you know, uh, that they, they talked about the, this solar phallus. But anyway, it's just associated with uh, the wind and it's also associated uh, with uh, Memnon. Now, uh, what, what he's trying to do, remember he's the heart chakra is both, cons uh, mixed with the air and the heart. And uh, so he's just trying to associate. Now this is Memnon in Egypt um, faces the dawn and those two statues, when the, the sun rises above the horizon, you can hear them sing. That was the legend that they actually, you could, if you were there, you would hear them sing. And uh, uh, they are the son of dawn, who's here and, uh, with us. But it, her name originally was Aurora, you know, as in Aurora Consurgens. And uh, uh, it's it's um, uh, the the um, it, it's it's starting to contrast the uh, uh, it's linking thought. Uh, in, emotions and the heart. So uh, Anahata is the, and is the first place to where we behold Purusha, okay? Now Purusha, now we've been acquainted with the unconscious in the water world and in the, um, in Manipura because those are forces that are beyond our control. In, in, in Muladhara, uh, you know, we, hit, we, we are very advanced in our awareness, but we haven't become acquainted with the unconscious. The Muladhara is the realm of modern civilization and all of its inventions, okay? And that elephant is the, is the driver of, of, of evolution. So in, in, in Svadhisthana and Muladhara, we start to um, become acquainted with something that's that Muladhara world knows nothing about and neither do Freud and Adler, you know. Now in Anahata is the first time that we behold what is called Purusha and Purusha is consciousness itself. And that would be the self, the non-ego self. And um, Jung is going to tell us that when we reach Vishuddha, you know, which is beyond Anahata, we've really entered the realm of quantum physics and, and, analytical, and, and analytical psychology, which is the realm of synchronicity. It's the unus mundus, you know? So uh, when we pass anahata, we are going to see things from the point of view of Purusha. But in, in anahata, we can only behold Purusha you know, and uh, getting into Vishuddha is not easy, you know. And of course, getting to into the last two chakras, uh, he says it's not even worth talking about, you know. But uh, anyway, the, um, uh, the uh, it's kind of like he will, he will make some analogies of what the, the world realm of the water bearer might be like, the Aquarian realm but he's not going to tell us anything about uh, um, uh, the, is it, what, what's the next one, Capricorn? It's the, or it's the, uh, no, it's the one of the, of the goat fish, you know, uh, what is that? Is that, um, I forget what that's called, but it's the one following Aquarius. 
you know. Oh, yeah, it is Capricorn. Thank you, Jan. Okay, so, uh, but he won't talk about that one because that'll be like 3,000 years from now. So anyway, um, Anahata is first where we first uh, behold Purusha, and Purusha is is this is um, is now the is not identical with causality anymore. It's it's a causal. It's not identical with blind nature. It's not acquainted with any energy that serves no purpose and uh, that just burns without transformation, which would be some of uh, what being trapped in Manipura. Uh, so uh, this, we're going to talk about more of Purusha in the further lectures, but in Anahata, we're lifted above the emotional uh, happenings in Manipura, which are important as in Muladhara and Svadhisthana, but we can't get become, uh, trapped there you know we have to, they they are powers that we need to die uh to assimilate i better keep moving oh boy oh my god i'm going slow so uh let it's um he goes through uh, a, a really good thing at the end uh about um the uh importance once you once you discover the self in anahata the danger is inflation of the ego and the individuation does not mean you become an ego. He says that is an individualist, someone who does not succeed in individuating uh, and uh, uh, an individual, an individualist, he says, is a philosophically distilled egotist. You know, to individuate means to become that which is not the ego. And that is very strange. To be individuate, means for you, me, to become that which is not the ego. And that is very strange. And he says, because no one understands the self. The self is that which we are not. To individuate, to become undivided, means that we unite with that which is not the ego. And that is very strange. Okay. In uh, individuate, in, in, in the individuated ego uh it discovers that is a mere appendix of the self and it's but it is in some very important loose connection with it you know and um now here's he's talking about the inflation ego lives in muladhara it lives in the basement the self lives in anahata you know and we're supposed to have this loose connection with it but we're not supposed to identify with um with the self, uh, because it's exceedingly impersonal, it's exceedingly objective. It's not, go ahead, Jordy. Yeah, just unmute there. No, if, yes. Well, uh, there are a couple of things to add what you are saying. Yeah, okay. Uh, from the experience of uh, a Westerner practicing Oriental meditation, uh, meditation orders the relation of the of the I I don't like the word the word ego. I, I can elaborate but later why I don't like the word ego. Mm -hmm. That the the I the, the me the German it mm -hmm. it's put in perspective uh, once you are connected somehow to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's put that way it gets aligned. It not yes. gets autonomous that is defensive yeah well i think what he means by ego and i'm not as sure if, how it's related to what freud's ego and his you know all his id and everything else he has when what young i think means means by ego is just that center of awareness of over which we have some control you know but i i'm not i i absolutely i'm with you jordy i don't really know what it means and and you can add some um, things to it, but um, yeah. To make the story short, the word ego was introduced into the English translation of Freud's by some fellow, I have the, I have the, the, the references somewhere, and it was this heavily discussed by a German a student of, of Freud saying that the meaning of ego in English 
is not what Freud had in mind, Freud, Jung, and the German tradition. In Spanish, it's, it's kind of uh, surrealistic because Freud was translated in the early 20s or late 10s, and it was translated by I. The, the use of ego come in the 50s when the complete works of Freud were translated in Argentina from the English, not from the original German. Yeah, well, yeah, and I'm not, we, we don't need, I don't, I, you know, it is, uh, we don't need to get bogged down in that right now, uh, but. Um, I know, but the problem, the problem with ego, uh, I am making that in the context of that meaning, of that meeting, has a, a religious and almost religion aspect, which can be distracting in the virtue or lack of virtue sense. Ego means disconnection, which is not necessary for the I. Yeah. The, yes, the, and go ahead. I don't want to go further now. I, I don't want to be okay. distracted. Yeah, well, it's not, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not disputing or saying anything you say. I'm saying everything you say is very valid. Yeah. But but what I'm the normal thing is let's just say our conscious awareness. We'll, we'll mm -hmm. stay away from ego. We'll just call it our conscious awareness. Okay, the no, awareness no. over which we're conscious. You know, um, to to become so if it's if it's divided, it's undivided. Mm -hmm. Wants to become undivided. Yeah. It, um, needs to um, uh, discover that our, this conscious awareness over which we do have control is a mere appendix of something that we don't have control over, which is called the self, but has some loose connection with it. And uh, it is in the fourth chakra that we discover the self. And this conscious awareness over which we have control lives in Muladhara. And the one we don't have under our control, I kind of like talking this way, <laughs> is the one in Anahata and, uh, 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 we don't want to become identified with it because that's kind of personality number two, but it's also not us, you know, but it's a, it's a center of awareness of which we're become acquainted with. We can see it in Anahata. We can't see it in Muladhara. So, and it's exceedingly impersonal uh, and exceedingly objective. And uh, uh, so um, it, it, at that point, our, our lives um, have become more objective when we've entered anahata, they become, now we're gonna hear, hear a lot more about anahata. So don't think this is, you under, if you don't understand anahata, don't worry, you will at the end. Um, but um, it's, he quotes uh, Paul saying, not I that lives, but the self in me, you know, is uh, the fourth in anahata chakra. Now I might just introduce a little bit of lecture three I went a little bit overwhelmed on or over in the review area. But I, I mean, when I started on this, I kind of forgot the first part and I just wanted to review it uh, again. So now um, what, what Young is going to do now, he's sort of introduced us. The first lecture was a really kind of a chaotic in, introduction. The second lecture is a little less chaotic. And now, now he's going to really start to, to add details. And so, He's um, talking about now the, the four centers that we've talked about, and he adds Vishuddha. And uh, they're all related to uh, elements. Muladhara is related to the earth. Svadhisthana is related to the water. Manipura is related to the fire. Anahata is related to the air. Vishuddha, the fifth chakra, is related to ether. Okay, what is ether? You know. Uh, now he's he's saying that these increase in volatility as you go forward. Earth is very solid in substance. Water's more fluid. Fire moves, and yet it has um, a a a power that can uh, you know change things right in front of your eyes. The air is invisible except when it blows. Ether. Now the Vishuddha is called the cleansed one. The cleansing, and I always heard it was purgation, you know, is where you are removing yourself from the world of, of volatility, you know, of, 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 or substance, you know. And ether, though, penetrates everything, but can't be caught, 
can't be measured. It's something like a thought, not, not, not a, an emotion, okay? It's the difference between a thought and emotion. A thought, an idea, a conception, a formulation. Something that is abstract from uh, others, things. And you only find it in your brain, nowhere else. Or, you know, in up here in the head, okay? And it's matter that is not matter. It's a concept. Now, we're going to get a, a little bit, you might feel a little bit lost here, but just be patient because um, we're going to circumambulate this about 100 times. So in the Vishuddha center is beyond the four elements of the earth. And it is um, the more, uh, it's, it is a state of consciousness that is removed from uh, from uh, sort of the fires of passion. That's what it means to be the cleansed one, the clean, the one who's purga purgation. You've entered the realm of ultimate con consciousness. He's gonna talk about this later, that it's, you really entered unus mundus or the world of synchronicity here, where uh, physics and psyche are one, you know? So uh, this, is, this is the realm of the Vishuddha, you know? but it's beyond the four elements. You've stepped beyond the empirical world and you've landed in the world of, of uh, this kind of a synchronistic world. And um, that it is, um, uh, what he calls it is psychical, psychical reality. You know, psych, uh, the science of psychical things. Uh, reality here is all, uh, Absolute reality is all related to psyche. It's, um, and it's a world of where the only substance is psyche. And it's the world of psychical reality. So uh, it, it's just, you know, it's sort of the informing wisdom of it. When they say ether is found everywhere, psychic reality is found everywhere. The pleroma is found everywhere, you know. So, uh, so we've transformed from earth to e ether and it's um, uh, the uh, concept of the five elements preceded the chakra system. It was part of the Sankhya philosophy. It's pre-Buddhistic. Um, it's from the seventh century BC at least. The Buddha's dates were 586. And the Upanishads arose out of Sankhya uh, philosophy uh, of the five elements. And uh, uh, this, um, and this is where the chakras emerge. Was from the five elements that were in a, in an older um, system, and in alchemy we find the same ideas: the transformation of gross uh, uh, matter into the subtle matter of mind. That's called sublimation. You know, the sub you time for a question. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, okay, so. A psychic reality, would that be similar to like seeing everything as symbols? Well, you know, yes. Things at the metal level? It would be where um, uh, it would be sort of the realm like this. Now, let, let's just say um, you, uh, let's say psychic reality is at the bottom of the ocean, you know, and everything that happens in our world is, is up on the surface, okay? I mean, it's just this idea of that what underlies reality. It's, it's like when you, when you see uh, somebody uh, go up to, this, to, a, a, to a, a, the background and picks it up and tries to look behind the screen, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, oh, or, or you know, uh, where uh, there was a, uh, um, this um, kitten uh, that was walking up to a mirror and it keeps walking back and forth across uh, from the mirror and then tries to look what's behind the mirror, you know? And, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell says, says that's uh, Vishuddha. <laughs> He's looking behind Maya, okay? You know, and uh, it would be sort of like in Plato's cave, you know, <laughs> where everybody's imprisoned and they're seeing the shadows dancing in front of them. Suddenly they're un leashed and they go outside the cave. 
So now they've entered the realm of psychic reality, you know? So, I mean, they've, they've looked behind the screen of this, this um, reality we live. So let's say you had a near death experience that you were, you experienced the Shuddha and then you came back here, you know? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about it, but it's the synchronistic world, you know? It's the world of, it's where psychic reality well, synchronicity, you know, is really the combination of a psychic event, which is outside of time and space, and a another event, it, and an a causal connection that creates meaning. You know, so um, it, it. And if you know anything about, um, you know, the alchemy, it's it's the realm of unus mundus, but it would also be the realm that's outside. Um, and here's another image of it is uh, the guy who falls out of Vishnu's mouth when he's sleeping on the cosmic sea. You know, he falls out of Vishnu's mouth. Suddenly he sees Vishnu sleeping on the cosmic serpent and dreaming the dream of the universe. And, and his consort Lakshmi, or is it Lakshmi or Parvati, who's m massaging his calf and stimulating the dream. And then, you know, so psychic reality is the reality that created life, okay? Where did this, uh, where did this um, forms of life, for instance, your brain violates every law of thermodynamics, every law of physics. It's, it's what they call the opposite of entropy. It's this improbable system of order, okay? Where did that come from? It came from psychic reality, you know? Psych it was the informing wisdom that, that created everything. What, what about this language I'm speaking? Where did that come from, you know? I mean, it came from psychic reality. Who tells um, the hummingbird to fly from, from, from uh, where Carlos lives up to uh, where Tim Holmes lives? Psychic reality told it, you know? I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's just this strange, very strange uh, realm of the self. Now he's gonna talk about it later in just this mind blowing uh, little paragraph of what it would be like to live in the Shuddha, okay? And that's a, actually in lecture three. Uh, so we get to see that real soon. But now I, I, I wanna, before we finish, I just wanted to, uh, talk about a couple things. Uh, his wonderful description of Manipura uh, as um, the, the fire center, and he, he brings up the cooking pot, you know, and, uh, you know, the, uh, this is this cooking pot uh, with the three handles on it, you know, and he says uh, uh, this um, Eliade and, and Howard, said that this was a swastika. Young said he hadn't seen many swastikas, but I actually have a friend who's from Sicily, you know, and uh, maybe uh, that's the flag of Sicily. <laughs> Can you believe that? It's, a, it's called a triskelos. And uh, by the way, I wanna show you a picture of my friend from Sicily. This is her tattoo. I don't know if you can see it very well, but <laughs> it's the Triskelos. So anyway, it's this three, three armed, uh, and by the way, it's very old. Uh, this is, let me, let me just show you a couple other uh, symbols of it. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is from early Europe. There's the Triskelos, you know, and uh, then here uh, is, uh, I was in Colombia a couple of years ago, staying at a um, kind of a bed and breakfast place mm -hmm. that had some of these spirals carved in the rocks in the in the cliff behind this place where we stayed. Yeah, uh, with these three, and and of course you know, in Colombia with something like these spirals. Yeah, I mean it's it's just this fascination. Now this is Celtic. So it's from Ireland, you know, but um, anyway, it's just this. Um, and then that, of course, uh, 
when were you in Colombia, uh, Tim? About three years ago. About three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was... Just on a nature trip or something, or? Well, I went down there to to uh, visit my girlfriend who is riding riding her bike across the Western Hemisphere. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, that's north to south, apparently. Yep. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, now I just want to mention before we uh, we'll go into uh, and Gary's got an exercise today, but um, it, th this uh, this Manipura Manipura is the handles of a pot to lift the pot. There's a lid, and he said, now he he's looking at this uh, as uh, from an alchemical standpoint. Manipura is the fire region. The kitchen, the the it's also in the stomach, and he says the kitchen is where food is cooked. And he says, it's like our outer stomach. You stuff food into the pot or into the belly and there it's heated by the blood, that's the stomach. And the, the, the same thing happens in your kitchen. The food's digested by stuffing it into your stomach and letting the heat of your body digest it. And, and cooking is an anticipation of the stomach. It's pre-digestion, you know. Uh, in fact, um, the stuff that, uh, that digests our food is called pepsin and it's uh, uh, people would take pepsin leaves and and take a piece of meat and just wrap it in pepsin leaves and that would pre-digest it but the whole art of cooking is pre-digestion you transfer your digestive abilities of the stomach into the kitchen now he's talking about the, that three-handled pot we just looked at and he's also talking about the alchemical vessel where we cook things. Kitchen is the stomach of every house. It's the, the labor of, of digestion is taking, taken away from the stomach. And the mouth also is pre-digestive organ, it, uh, you know, like a food chopper. And uh, so the kitchen is a digestive tract projected outside the human, human body. It's also the alchemical place where things are transformed. You know, and, and what, do you, what do you use to cook um, things in alchemy? You use the attention of ego. So if you give the attention of ego to the empty vessel, whatever is in it will cook. Usually you give the attention of ego to the vessel, something appears, then you give it more attention, it, um, it will uh, transform, you know. So Manipura is the center where substances are digested and transformed. And... He says, one would expect to see the completed transformation, but no, you know, uh, you have to uh, trans, uh, uh, and, and we're going to hear a lot about this next time, is going from the diaphragm to the, uh, across into anahata is a real trip in itself. And going from, from anahata to Vishuddha, he's going to describe the transformation in case studies that he's done with some of his patients. He's gonna give us some examples of that. But um, anyway, um, maybe I could give you an example uh, before we go. I got, we don't have much time. Um, so uh, let me see if I can just give it a quick summary. I didn't get as far as I wanted to be. But anyway, um, he's going to give us a lot of patient material that is going to describe uh, uh, these centers for us. Um, uh, and he's also going to bring up the uh, how the atom and atomic physics is related to it, uh, to the ether region. And uh, so this is going to be a real tour of, of not just psychic reality, but physical reality and the transformational aspect of, um, of and I'm, I'm going to, for Jordy's sake, I'm always going to say, from, for our conscious awareness to transform and to the realm of what is not, does not belong to consciousness, our, our own personal conscious. It's going to be a, a different, and then through those, those uh, that, the, that, that dialogue to create a third center of awareness now, which is above both and leads somewhere. You know, it's going somewhere. You know, the, the whole idea is you, you get a dream, 
you write the dream down, you think about the dream. It's, it's suddenly, as you think about it and, and walk around it and give it two things, you give it the medium of expression through a, a, a wordless um, expression in the outer world. And then you, then you also try to provide meaning to it. You've, you've made, you create it almost a symbol. You'll cease, it will have a numinous power that every time you look at it, you're going to um, be in that place that you were in the dream and also be in that place where you applied, uh, you, you had this active imagination with it. And he says, you will never be the same. You personally will never be the same after you did that little exercise with that dream, okay? And he says, and by the way, the next dream, the unconscious sins will also be, be transformed by you working with that dream. And so it's leading somewhere, it's going somewhere. And you do this long enough, and then you look at what you were like five years before and where you are now through very um, devoted work to this, you'll see it go somewhere, you know? So anyway, um, I'm gonna um, just open it up. Uh, why don't we get comments from everybody and then I'm gonna turn it over to Gary. So uh, why don't, why don't uh, Gary, you can sum up at the end, but why don't, uh, Carlos, do you have anything to add or you just wanna, just listening? Okay. Tim, do you have anything? Any about anything? Okay, Jordy. Uh, well, I I have to consider the reference of the Kundalini, the chakra element, as mainly and basically symbolic, mm -hmm. not as say physical places as are understood in the twenty first century in the Western world. I mean, they have associate meanings and references and symbolisms. Uh, otherwise, I have to rework all you have said and reread the originals again. Uh, there is plenty of materials. Uh, said that, I don't know if uh, Jung will write with the same emphasis 50 years later that when it was uh, formulating or see if you wish discovering the whole thing. Said that, I think he got the intuit, the young intuition, more than anything else, was a spot on. Yeah. Well, uh, well, the... you will use very different words nowadays, using the uh, Jungian language. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is it. I mean, to me. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I, I I see that you know you know he's really saying is is what his 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 point is if you just look at all these powers as not real and just metaphors they not don't really think he's he says you're really saying that you that the muladhara world is the is the only reality you know the reality of, of three dimensional where man is the only power there and what young is trying to say and and this is just one system there's other many other examples is that that there these are real powers and they are actually the real reality you know that lies behind this world that we're so proud of and and uh, are so inflated of so it is actually it's, it's only symbolical where young says symbols are really our true existence is is in symbol now this is a very introverted point of view by the way no. It's a very intuitive and introverted point of view that an extrovert would not have any sympathy. I, I am introvert too, myself. Yeah. And, and I see your point and I agree. Uh, now, discussing what reality is, it's in, an, in another domain. Mm -hmm. More to the point, it's consistent with my experience. And I wouldn't say it's a psychic reality, it's more than that when you tune, tune, uh, tune to that. Uh, otherwise, there is a window and there is a middle point, which is a sweet middle point, when you can have one feet on both realms and be sort of a bridge, to be sort of a little pontifex for your own benefit. Well, and Young says you can't leave Muladhar. 
you always have to have your feet there. Otherwise, you're going to get eaten up by the makara. You're going to get burned up by the flame. And, you know, you're going to be a seed that's born up in the sky. That You always have to have your feet on the ground you, uh, while you live. And this is uh, very similar to uh, Hermes Trismegistus saying that, you know, your strength is perfected when it returns to the earth, that the rubedo is the most important thing. Your, your educated GP will say you are at risk of an acute psychotic episode. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine. Which yeah. What's happened? I mean. Yes. Right. In a way, you are close to altered states of consciousness. Well, yeah, and it's he's just um, you know who's he studying? Zosimos, uh, uh, Gerhard Dorn, uh, Jacob Burma. Uh, this the sea the um, the uh, that Cirrus uh, that uh, they wrote about I can't remember what her name was but I mean these are the people where he thinks they have had glimpses plus his own patients dreams which yeah. he recognizes are not ego dreams Tim did you have a something to add yeah, well I'm just uh, going to pass on Jan's question that she asked last week too um, how does physics relate to the Muladhara? Uh, physis relate to the Muladhara. Now by physis, um, what, what exactly do you mean, Jan? Can you uh, give me a description of it or she just put a, a Wikipedia link on that, on the chat. Okay, let me look real quick. Um, how does that relate to Muladhara is the question. Let's see, all right, let's see. Okay, let's see. Physis. Okay. All right. Okay, now he, he is going to uh, describe, uh, uh, you know, that um, is a Greek philosophical theological site term, uh, natura, the term originated in ancient Greek. Uh, it is uh, well known. Uh, it's the case, it's the article. It is considered the equivalent of, of, well, the lumen natura, is that what we're talking about? Is the uh, light of nature? And uh, it's like roots. Plants yeah. Plants go through this underground growth. Yeah. Well, um, if, if it's um, the uh, question of the lumen natura, which is the informing wisdom of nature, and how is that related to, to uh, Muladhara? Is that right, Jan? I, I don't think I'm really understanding. I'm gonna to have to read a little bit more about physics. Does anybody have any comments about physics that, I mean, I I, it says natura, lumen natura. Go ahead, Kevin. I can, I can perhaps comment. I just showed a picture of iron. Um, hmm. In the book, Iron, Carl Jung uh, uh, writes about um, the stone basically. And he also writes about the spirit, spirit impregnate stone. So physics, spirit, Two, two opposite of the same coin. Uh, coin. Mm -hmm. And how do they relate? One cannot exist without the other. Yeah, yeah we are a living proof of that. Mm -hmm. and, and this is also our understanding of God. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So this is a more spiritual aspect of the God image. But at the same time, there is also a physical aspect and which is, you know, Adam and Eve made of earth. And uh, so, so okay. How does how does physics relate to the world of the other? It's because they are the, the same. Is that they are the same uh, in two different sides, basically. Um, and and that's and the one that unifies both of them is psyche. The one that is the living reality is uh, is psyche. It's a god image, basically. Well, it it's just to me, it's very very similar to. Uh... Uh, what they said about, um, you, you, you know, uh, it, it is looking at the world with a new set of, you know, first I thought that rivers were rivers and mountains were mountains, and then I knew they weren't. And then after uh, after I achieved Satori, I, then I knew that rivers were rivers and mountains were mountains. And, and then Christ uh, was asked by the disciples, when will the kingdom of the Father come? And he says, it's spread upon the earth right now that men don't see it, you know, change the focus of the eye. It's a different way of looking at things. 
But Young said very clearly that if you leave Muladhara, you're going to be eaten up by the Makara. You're going to be burned up in the fire. You always have to have your feet in Muladhara. Yeah, go ahead, Jordi. Of precisions concerning physics. Physics, I am Latin speaker. Natura in, in Latin means several things, but condition as per human condition, what's great nature, mm -hmm. what's great condition, and substance, what's great substance. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the classical opposition is between nature and manufacture in Aristotelian terms. Something not elaborated, not manufactured. Something elaborated, but non-manufactured. Something yeah. not elaborated or not manufactured. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's something that sprouts up from the earth of itself. Is that what you mean? Uh, that's given for granted. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the instance of God is being an animal, blah, blah, blah. The yeah. The feet of God or the nature of God. And that can be even gone as farther as, further as the essence of yourself. Mm -hmm. The human, the human condition. Well, well, you know, Jung is, is really going to tell us here that uh, Western man will never get past Anahata, you know, because they will not leave Muladhara, that they need to keep their feet on the ground, you know. And this is, was his, that was what saved him during his Red Book visions and his Black Book visions, is that he never let his feet leave Muladhara, even though he was encountering these visions and the synchronistic world, the unis mundus. You know, he was encountering all that, but he did it uh, with a, a very human, and this, this is what is so unique, I think, about Jung, is that he did it and didn't get inflated by it. You know, he, he always was saying he was going back through all these systems to I am a cave painter at Lascaux. You know, how can this stuff inform me as a hunter-gatherer who's not going to stop being a hunter-gatherer? You know, I'm just going to just carry wood and chop water, or chop wood and carry water all my life, which he did at Bollingen, you know. His, his uh, you, know, you know, the whole idea with, with Marie-Louise von Franz uh, was her opposition to yoga was that to her, it was more important to spend time in deep woods and in with nature, uh, being out in nature was more important to her than the abstractions of yoga, you know, or meditation, you know, that it was more important for her to feel what somebody told me one time that once they go into the woods, all the, the stiffness in their joints go away and everything. And there's just this idea of going in there and listening to silent Talia, you know, who, who sings in the woods or to pan, you know, and then to interpret all these images. Yet with your feet in Muladhara, you know, all the time. And I think you're gonna find through this whole thing he never leaves Muladhara. Now, I don't think I've fully answered your question, Jan, but um, I, I'm gonna have to do a little bit more reading about uh, physics. Where did you hear the term physics and how is that related to Muladhara? You might wanna put that in the text, that'd help. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Gary now, but Gary, you can do anything you want with the last 30 minutes if anybody wants to talk or anything. I didn't, Charles and Marina didn't get a chance to say anything, but. Go ahead. You know, so I was going to do a uh, dialoguing with paintings exercise, but I thought, you know, before I do that, you know, we're, we're doing all this talking about uh, Kundalini and chakras. And I, you know, I wanted, to, and, and Jordy's comments on the chakras. And to me, the chakras are very much a, a felt type of experience. And, um, you know, one of the recommendations I would make is if you go up to Insight Timer, and this is a free one, 
and I'll, I'll have uh, Craig send out the link, but there's a classical celloist that, you know, she plays for each of the ch chakras. And of course, and, and you know, what you're doing is you're, you're doing an active imagination, you know, with this, but I, you know, I, I swear when she plays this, you know, I can, I can feel each of these chakras, you know, and it's like, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a very interesting experience, you know, and of course it's active imagination. But, you know, I think that's, that's the skill that we're trying to uh, refine. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is I, you know, I'm, I've, I'm always doing Kundalini now before doing meditation. It seems to help my meditations quite a bit. And, and with this, you know, with all of us talk about Kundalini, you know, we could, instead of doing the dialoguing with paintings, I could... Uh, just give like a really brief introduction to Kundalini Yoga. People are interested, put do a thumbs up. Otherwise, I'll do the dialoguing with paintings. So um, the, what I'm going to, okay. So for Kundalini Yoga, the, there's a couple of, of different things which are important and what I need, and so one of them is being able to do this bind, and and the bind is called Moabunda. And actually, what I need, I need everyone to stand up. So stand up, because I'm gonna, I need to teach you, you know, how this actually feels. So you need to stand up, and then put your heels together, so that they're coming out roughly at a ninety, and then push together on the heels. Now, when you push together on the heels you feel the core turn on and you also feel the glutes turn on. Now, if you do Pilates at all, the one other thing that's good to add to this is that it's, it's not so much, it, you are pulling your stomach in, but it's kind of doing a tightening of the muscles on the side, okay? So this is the Mola Bunda and I'm going to put up a, uh, the, you know, my favorite Kundalini uh, exercise that, that I do, you know, when I, uh, just before I do my meditation. So you can, you can sit down now. And when we do this, when we do this Kundalini uh, yoga, you don't have to be sitting on the floor. And, but what, you know, what I'd recommend is, you know, sit towards the edge of the seat so that, you know, so that you're engaging your back muscles. And then there's, there's two more things to, to talk about before we, you know, before I start this video. Um, and when we do the bind, which is what we did when we put the heels together and, and just try it now, just sitting on the edge of your chair. So sitting on the edge of your chair, tighten up those muscles. Okay, so that's, that's the physical aspect of it. But the, the spiritual aspect of it is that while you are doing this, you should imagine the chi, the life energy, the aliveness, you know, flowing up from the root chakra up to the crown chakra. So what you're doing is that you're, you're taking the, the aliveness, the chi, and you're sending it up through the chakras. Now, the that's that's the visualization when you do the bind. Now, the other thing that you need to be aware of is how they do their breathing. Um, so when you do Kundalini breathing, and this will primarily be kind of a uh, fire breath, what you do is you take an inhale and you know and you you let the uh, you know you you let your, your stomach come out so that you're doing deep abdominal breathing. And so, and then when you breathe out, you kind of do it a bit forcefully. So it's sort of a, you know, it's like a, you know, a quick contraction of those muscles. Um, so, and that's, that's called a fire breath. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out a way to share my screen. Cool. I think we're at where I need to be. And... Right. Cool. And I'm 
going to, so we'll do, let's do like, I'm going to do like 12 minutes of this or wherever it looks like a good stop point. And then at that point, we'll stop and we'll discuss it. So remember, remember the, the bind where all those muscles tighten. Remember the, the visualization of the life energy flowing up to the crown chakra. And remember the fire breath, which is, um, you know, a, you know, a, a, a deep abdominal breath and then sort of a, you know, a contraction of the stomach muscles to force it out. So here goes. And you might, you, you might want to mute uh, and turn off your video so you can kind of follow along with this. Um, and I'm going to mute too. We can't hear the sound. Okay, let me start up again. Are we good? Still no sound. Still no sound? So we had no sound during that time, is that right? Right. Let me try one more time and then otherwise we'll... Oh, I see what I did. Share computer sound. Okay. Different areas of How the spine. There we go. Open up the energy and get that cerebrospinal fluid moving. This has a very positive impact on brain health and cognition and helps us to feel really open and energized. So to begin, we're going to tune in with a mantra called Om Namo Guru Dev Namo. This is our way in Kundalini Yoga of honoring the teachings of all the teachers who have gone before us. It's our way of kind of saying, okay, this is sacred time for me to dive into me, to create uh, harmony in this mind, energy, body <laughs> unit that I call myself. So Om Namo Guru Dev Namo. Om Creative Consciousness Namo. I bow to Guru Dev, beloved teacher or one that moves me from darkness to light. And we consider that the inner teacher. Namo. I bow to. So I bow to the divine creative consciousness in all things, I bow to the teacher within. Just listen the first time, hum along the second time, join me the third time, and, uh, and let's tune in. So rub the palms to stimulate the energy of the hands and the heart. And then we place the hands, the thumbs, right on the sternal notch. So the thumbs along the length of the sternum bone, lift your chest, chin slightly in, and here we go, inhaling. Om Namo Guru Dev Namo Om inhale and exhale so that ong o-n-g you're vibrating the roof of the mouth and you're vibrating the whole brain with that sound so even that has a very positive powerful impact so let's come sitting where the shins are actually crossed in the middle and your hands are on your shins. And we're just going to move the lower spine, inhaling and exhaling. Okay. 
Keep your chin so that it's parallel to the ground. That way you're isolating the movement in your lower spine. And you just let the breath gently sniff in and out through the nose. And what you'll feel is that you're massaging the uh, muscles down in the lower spine, lower spine, kidney area. Really great practice for creating uh, a healthy, vibrant spine. Keep going. And by the way, you can also do this sitting up on a chair or a cushion if you find that your knees are way up and you're not getting much movement. You can always sit on a chair with your feet flat on the ground. And now let's inhale deeply. Pause the breath, apply mulabund, lifting the lower belly, lifting the pelvic floor, the sit bones hug toward one another, Keep pressing that energy up. You can see it moving up through the spine all the way to the center of the brain. And then exhale. And then just relax for a moment. Sit tall with your eyes closed. You can place your hands onto your knees. And just notice, be aware of yourself in this moment. How does your body feel? How does your energy feel? Can you sense that as we move energy and it goes from a dull state to an enlivened state, we start to feel rather than heavy and sluggish, we start to feel lighter and brighter. So the next pose we're going to do, we'll sit on our heels. Now, if sitting on your heels is hard for your knees or the fronts of your ankles, you can stay seated exactly like this with your hands on your knees. Otherwise, come sitting in what we call Vajrasana. So you're sitting on your heels and your hands are on your thighs. And we'll inhale and arch forward. So now you can get more movement in the whole spine and exhale, push back. Again, be mindful not to let the head move. The chin stays parallel. We inhale forward and exhale back. So your whole pelvis rocks forward and then goes back. So the spine is getting a full flexion and extension or arch and round. Heart presses forward and back. Once you've got the movement going, close your eyes so you can really get into the felt experience. And you go at your pace, whatever feels natural to you. Breathing in, breathing out, evenly. Keep going just a little bit longer. So you're stimulating the muscles all the way along the spine here. You're stimulating the nerve ganglia that connect to each one of the energy centers along the spine. 
So those nerve ganglia also stimulate the glands throughout the body. And now let's take a deep inhale, spine neutral, pause the breath, squeeze mula bun. So the tailbone draws under slightly, the sit bones hug in, the lower belly lifts, chin in, visualize that energy, see it moving, feel it moving up the spine to the center of the brain. And then exhale, take a deep inhale, Full exhale. And again, just tune in and observe the subtle shifts happening within you right now as you open up your energy. The yogis say you're only as old as your spine. So here we are revitalizing the spine. and stimulating the nerves that feed all of the organs of the body. Next, you'll come back to a seated posture with one shin crossed in front of the other. And we're going to lift our hands up to our shoulders. So the elbows are at the height of the shoulders Hands come back, fingers in front, thumbs behind. And we'll inhale to the left and then exhale to the right. So as soon as you're ready, let the chin stay in line. Let the chin stay in line with the chest. If you have a tender back, you can move more slowly and just stay within the range that feels good for you today. And take a deep inhale to the center. Pause the breath, keep the hands where they are. Squeeze the mulaband, lift the pelvic floor, lower belly, lift the diaphragm slightly, holding the breath in, but squeezing, and squeezing up through the spine towards the center of the brain. And as you're ready, exhale. Nice work. Just rest for a moment. Be still with your eyes closed. Feel into your experience. Okay, so that's Kia Miller. Oh, hang on. Okay. Um, so that's Kia Miller. Uh, she's one of my favorite Kundalini teachers on uh, Glow, G-L-O dot com. She's probably worth the price of Glow alone. Um, but, you know, I find there's there's another practice I do with, uh, with some people. And it's, it's a Kriya and it's done without the binds. And I just find, you know, and even though that's a lot more intense as far as, uh, you know, maybe upsetting the CO2 balance, you know, I find that the Kundalini 
with the binds where you visualize, you know, raising the energy is just, you know, far, far more effective. Um, and what I will do is from Insight Timer, I will send a, uh, a Kundalini Chakra course. You know, it's, it's just a free one that you can look at. And I'll also try to find uh, uh, the woman that does the cello. Uh, she's Chinese, but, you know, she just plays this. Oh, you know, it's all original. She plays, you know, a short piece for each chakra where you, you know, where you visualize the chakra. And it's, uh, you know, it's a really good way to, uh, you know, sort of get that felt experience. Comments? Would be good. But this is completely different. So I can imagine that um, if you set some time aside, also I can imagine how it would. Marina, your, your sound isn't working very well. Your mic isn't working. It's kind of cutting in and out. Okay. Try again. Try again. Can you hear me? 